Yeah, so this is a talk about learning representations of concepts. So the first thing you want to know is why are we interested in concept learning at all? So I'm going to provide some very high level motivation from a, a modern AI perspective. So let's think about a large scale language model like GPT-3. You're all familiar with these language models. Um, and we might ask the question, does GPT-3 have concepts? So does it know about watermelons, for example? Um, and it certainly knows something about watermelons. It's essentially been trained on the whole of the internet. It's read Wikipedia. So if I were to give this sentence to GPT-3 and ask it to tell me more, if this were a prompt, I haven't done this experiment, but I wouldn't be surprised if we got another sentence like this about the watermelon. So something about health, esteem, and vitamin levels. So it, we can ask the question again, does GPT-3 have a concept of what a watermelon is? And then there's evidence from using these large-scale language models that maybe they do do something like conceptual reasoning. But I'm a bit skeptical about that claim. And if we think about the human conceptual system and what I know about a watermelon, and I really like this picture of the child biting in. You know, I look at that and I can almost feel the sort of juice dripping down my chin when I'm eating it, the crunchy texture, these really bright, vivid colors of the watermelon. So my claim is that GPT-3 is just really a symbol prediction machine. All it has is knowledge about associations between symbols. There's no grounding, to use a term from cognitive science, and I would claim that's necessary to have a conceptual system. Now, all I've done so far is really argue for multimodality in AI systems. And these days, of course, large-scale language models are trained on other modalities. There was a system came out a week or two ago from DeepMind that made the news that was trained to do lots of different things, including playing video games and so on, essentially trained as a large-scale language model. So I think I need to take the argument a step further and say that we'd also like these, we'd like explicit conceptual representations in the AI system. And you'll see what I mean by explicit. So what I essentially mean is, if I were to ask the question, what's the concept for red? I can give you a very explicit answer, and I'll be able to do that with my, with my models. Um, and why do we want these explicit representations? Well, the hope would be with an AI agent that had conceptual representations, it can do better reasoning, maybe it's more sample efficient, maybe more explainable and fair, and all these things we'd like from, from AI systems. That's the, the hope. So that's just a bit of high-level motivation for why trying to learn concepts is a useful thing to do. So the the rest of the talk is in two parts. The first part is about a classical system. Um, we've made a tweak to a model called a variational autoencoder, and we think it's enough of a tweak to give it a new name. We call it the conceptual VAE. So this is gonna be a purely classical model that learns concepts based on very simple images. And then the second part, this is really work in progress, but this is some work where we're trying to take ideas from the conceptual VAE and make them quantum. So I want to ask the question, if we have concepts represented in some Hilbert space, say, as states or effects, um, how useful could that be? Is that an interesting thing to do? So I've got some preliminary results on the quantum side, but it's mainly a bunch of ideas at this stage. So we're right in the middle of doing that work. Now, before I get on to all that, let me introduce the, uh, the team working on concepts. So Razine has written most of the code, if not all of the code, and run some of the experiments. Sean's our resident category theorist. Uh, so he formalizes our models, makes sure we're doing the right thing on the quantum side. Uh, Sara helped with the coding and um, developed the first data set that we use, and I set the high-level direction and even do some experiments myself. Um, okay, so let's look at the data. Now, uh, concept learning is really hard. Eventually, the, lo the long-term goal would be a robot walking around its environment learning conceptual representations that enable it to act and reason and so on. We're nowhere near that, that at that stage at the moment, so we're really simple. The input's gonna be these images taken from some software from DeepMind. They have a concepts team that, in fact, I used to work with a few years ago. Um, so we use their software to develop these images that consist of these shapes, and we have three types of shapes. So we've got squares, circles, and triangles. Um, and this is gonna be one of the concepts. So there's gonna be the concept of square, the concept of circle. We want the system to try and learn that. Uh, the data set, uh, sorry, in this basic data set, the shapes can be three different colors, uh, red, green, and blue. Um, you can perhaps see that there are different shades here. So some of the reds 
So some of you will look a bit orangey, that's deliberate. Um, and some of the blue looks a bit maybe purpley and violet. So the way we've set it up, there's sort of a range of colors that we would still call blue. Um, the shapes have different sizes, small, medium, and large. And then finally, they can be in three different positions at the top, in the middle, and at the bottom. So these four different um, attributes we call conceptual domains. So we take this word from uh, terminology from garden floors, conceptual spaces that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, so yeah, so we've got these four domains and we want a system that can learn the individual concepts. Now our first system is, as I said, purely classical. It's gonna be based on something called a variational autoencoder. There's a lot of work out there in the literature already using VAEs for concept learning. You might have heard something called a beta VAE that was introduced by DeepMind about five years ago. Now, one thing that's really important to clarify with our work is that what the beta VAE tries to do is learn the conceptual domains. So given these images, the job is to work out that there are these four factors of variation, of the shape, the color, the size, and the position. That's a really important problem and one that we will absolutely have to solve to get all the way to the robot, but we're not trying to do that, just to be clear. So we're gonna make life a bit easier for ourselves and assume that we know the conceptual domains in advance. The reason we do that is we still think then there's an interesting question of what should the conceptual representations be? So given we know the domains, how should we represent and can we still learn the concepts? So let me just talk you quickly through how a VAE works. So for those people who aren't familiar with it, hopefully you'll get a feel for how this thing's trained and what it's designed to do. So the first thing to say about the VAE is that it's a generative model. It's a probabilistic generative model. Um, and it's a very simple model. So the idea is that in order to generate instances, and in this case, it's these images, uh, the generative process, what we first of all do is we sample a point from this latent space, Z, and I'll tell you what form that takes in a minute. And the idea is that this is meant to be a kind of bottleneck. It's gonna be a much smaller space than the space of pixels that the images live in. So given a, a point in that bottleneck, sort of latent space, then we have some probability distribution here over images X given a point in that space. And one of the clever sort of innovations in the VAE was the idea that you could parameterize this probability distribution using a powerful neural network. So because we're going from the latent space to an image, we use something called a deconvolutional neural network, which is kind of the opposite direction to a standard CNN. Um, and then notice we've got this dashed line here. This is called, oh, sorry, let me say, this is called the decoder, this probability of image given latent point. Um, there's this dashed line in the other direction. This is not part of the graphical model, but you'll see it it's, plays a really important role in the training of this model. That's called the encoder. So what form does this um, latent space take? Well, it's, the, it's a prior distribution, and typically what you do is you assume that it's a, um, a multivariate Gaussian um, with a diagonal covariance matrix. That's just a really fancy way of saying that if we've got four dimensions in that space, each one of them is just a standard unit normal. So what we're gonna do, again, just to repeat the generative process, for each one of the, say, four dimensions, we'll sample a Z from a normal unit Gaussian Given that point, we'll then deterministically generate an image using the deconvolutional network. And all this thing has to be trained, all the parameters of the network and so on. That's the standard VAE. Uh, the little tweak that we make um, is to introduce another random variable at the top. So this C label, which is the label of the concept. The reason we want to do that is because if I just go back to this one, one thing that always bothered me about the VAE for concept learning is that there's no way in this model of being able to refer to the concept. So I'm a language person sort of by training. I'm interested in natural language processing. So I want a model where um, I've got an explicit representation of the concept red, for example, and the label red needs to be there somewhere in the graphical model. So what we do is we stick this, um, this node at the top, this random variable, you can, maybe you can just about see that the C and the X are sort of shaded gray. That just means that they are visible in the data. Whereas the latent space is hidden, that's the thing that we're trying to learn. So now the, the, um, the model's slightly different in terms of the generative process. So what we have now is we always start out with a set of four labels from our domain. So we might start out with blue circle, medium and top. And the difference now is that each one of those labels has a Gaussian associated with it, but it's not a unit normal. 
So we call these conceptual priors and we put the scare quotes on the priors because it's really important to realize that these are learned. So what we want to do is try and learn a Gaussian for the color blue. And then if you ask me, going back to an earlier question, you know, what's the concept, sorry, what's the representation of the concept blue? I can tell you it's, a, it's gonna be a Gaussian on the, in the color domain and I'll be able to give you the mean and the variance. So in this model, that's what a concept is. Um, okay, so what else can I tell you? So we've got this um, factored latent space. So we assume we've got these four dimensions, color, shape, size, and position. We put on a couple of extra what we call slack dimensions. These are just unit normals which are designed to capture sort of any additional variability in the image that's not captured by the four domains. So that's not too important, just a little detail. So just to yeah, sort of clarify what we're trying to do here, the goal is to learn these conceptual priors as part of this system. So how do we do it? So here's um, the loss function. I'm gonna talk you very briefly through this, again, just to get, so you get an idea of how this training works. So let's look at the expression on the left. This is basically the log likelihood here. So this is the probability of a data instance X, an image given four conceptual labels at the top. So all our data is supervised in terms of knowing what the labels are. And in generative modeling, that's the thing that you want to maximize. You want to maximize the probability of the data. Um, now that's a really hard thing to do in general. We just can't calculate that probability. So again, one, another thing that was clever about the VAE was that people realized that you can write out this expression here, where this is the log likelihood minus some KL divergence. That was, that's what that D is, it's a KL. And because KL is always positive, uh, the expression on the left is a lower bound on the likelihood. So ELBO stands for evidence lower bound. And the idea is that if we parameterize these, so that's the decoder, remember, this P and the encoder Q with very powerful neural networks, during the optimization, the hope is that that KL goes down to zero and we'll end up optimizing for the likelihood. That's all a bit hand wavy, but that's sort of the motivation for what's going on. Now we can't calculate those um, values on the left, but with a bit of just quite simple algebraic manipulation, you can get the expression on the right, and this is something we can optimize for. So let me talk you through those two um, expressions on the right. So the first one's called the reconstruction loss. So I'm gonna talk you through the the cycle in a training loop in a minute, but let's, so let's just, um, well, let's go through that actually now. So the way this is gonna work is given an input image with four labels, what we're gonna do is put that through our encoder, which is gonna be a convolutional neural network. That convnet will predict the values of four Gaussians, so that's like the conceptualization stage. Then we'll sample a point from those four Gaussians run that through the, uh, the deconvolutional neural network, the decoder, to get a reconstructed image, and then we'll calculate the difference between those two to get a reconstruction loss. So that's like an autoencoding loop. That's basically what I've just described. Now, it's not just an autoencoder, the VAE, because I also have this um, KL loss. So when the encoder takes the image and predicts these four Gaussians, we want those Gaussians to be close to these conceptual priors. Remember I said that the meaning, oh sorry, the, the explicit representation of the concept red is a Gaussian with a mean and a variance, and we want to learn those values. So for example, here, if we look at the first dimension, which I'm assuming is the color dimension, when the encoder predicts this Gaussian, I want it to be close to the Gaussian for red. Now it feels a bit circular here, because remember I'm telling you that we're learning the Gaussian for red, but it's fine because there's a pressure in the system to push the colors apart. Because if it didn't, it'd have a really hard time reconstructing the image because it wouldn't know whether it was red or blue or green. So there's a natural pressure here to get a nice clustering effect. And I'm gonna give you evidence that the system in fact does that a bit later. So I've already talked us through the loop, but let's go through again. So given one training instance, which is an image with four labels, run that image through an encoder, which is just a convolutional neural network, completely standard. Um, that predicts the means and variances for our four conceptual domains plus the two slack dimensions I talked about. At that point, we can calculate the KL loss. So are we close to the Gaussian for red on the first dimension, triangle on the second dimension, and so on? Um, and then notice the reconstruction loss. I didn't say this. This is actually an expectation. So we're going to approximate that with a Monte Carlo sample. All that means is that we're going to sample um, a point um, 
from this distribution or these four distributions to um, approximate that expectation and then we'll run that point in the latent space through our decoder, get an image and then calculate the reconstruction loss. So that's how the loop works. And in practice, we've got, we generate a data set of 3,000 training instances. Um, we use stochastic gradient descent to actually add in. A uh, very simple compnet because the images are trivial, just four layers, run for 200 epochs and Resine's code is really quick, so this takes about 20 minutes on a, on a GPU. So that's the sort of training in practice. So what do we get at the end of all that? Remember I said that there's pressure to try and push these concepts apart, and you see this really beautifully in this visualization that Razine produced. So I need to talk you through exactly what's happening here. So let's look at the plot on the top left. So this is for the first dimension, which corresponds to color. So what we've done is we've taken a lot of instances in our data and run them through the encoder. So each point, there's lots of points here, each of these points corresponds to an instance in the data. And along here, we're plotting the mean as predicted by the encoder on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we've got the variance. And then because we know the first dimension corresponds to color, what we can do is color code the instances according to the label that they were labeled with in the data. So in other words, all these here on the left, this sort of purple color, we know they were all labeled blue. The ones in the middle were all labeled green and the ones at the end were all labeled red. So you're seeing exactly that separation I talked about. So the encoder is predicting means, particularly the means, don't worry about the variances so much, such that it separates those three colors. It's a bit more interesting for the sizes because these are a little less discreet. So here you see the same effects. I'm looking at this plot in the middle at the top. So the, the red ones on the left, these are all the um, instances that were labeled small. The green ones in the middle were all the ones that were labeled medium, and then the ones on the right were labeled large. And notice that medium does sit between small and large, so really nice ordering, and that's fairly robust. We tend to see that with most of the runs, and I'm gonna come back to that point a bit later about that ordering effect. And then you get a nice clustering effect again for shape. Similar story for position. So this center is the one in the middle, the green, you can just about see, I think. One on the left is top, one on the right is bottom. And then the final two plots are for the slack dimensions. And here we don't really want to see a pattern at all. So these have been color coded by shape in this particular example. We don't want the slack dimensions to be encoding any information about shape. That would be a kind of sort of conceptual leakage into those slack dimensions. And then you can see that's pretty random. That's what we're looking for. Um, so another thing we can do visually that's very um, effective, I think, is do these uh, latent traversals. So what we've done here is we've taken this red circle as input. We run it through the encoder. That gives us a mean. And then what we can do is systematically vary that mean along um, each dimension. Um, and then we run, um, we run those means through the, through the decoder to get a sample. So let me, let me have a better go at explaining that. So um, we've run this red circle through the encoder. I've got a particular mean value here for the latent dimension zero, which corresponds to color. And then I just vary that mean value all the way along there and run it through the decoder and get these different colored shapes. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that, again, we've got this nice effect where information about color is encoded on that first dimension. And you also get this rather nice effect where you can see this sort of transition from blue to green, where this circle's got a little bit of both. And then the second dimension, latent dimension one, that encodes, uh, you can see it encodes size. So as we vary the mean on that and run it through the decoder, we go from large to small, left to right. And then the third dimension encodes shape. And again, we get this rather nice effect where when we're transitioning from square to circle, you see this sort of funny thing that's a bit like a square and a circle at the same time. So this sort of nice continuous representation of the concept. Um, so here's one more example. This is a blue triangle, this time for position. So we're encoding position really nicely from top to bottom. And then you can see in this one, actually, the, the latent dimension here is encoding what looks like positional information a little bit. So that's what we do not want. But there seems to be some sort of leakage where the VAE has decided to encode some positional information in that latent dimension. And then just one more example. So I talked about the fact that medium tends to be between sm uh, small and large. 
on the size dimension. So let's push this a bit further and do it for color. So here we've encoded all the seven colors of the rainbow. And this effect is quite robust that you get this nice ordering. So um, I don't think I've said this, but when we start out the training, the parameters of the conceptual prize are just randomized initially. So the ordering is going to be all over the place, but the VAE learns to put um, blue followed by indigo, followed by violet, red, orange, yellow. I'm trying to remember my mnemonic for the rainbow I learned as a child, and then green just out to the side. So there's some sort of continuity effect going on where because of the way we've set up the data, blue and, and indigo are close in RGB space, which is how we generate the data, and there's some continuity in the network that it learns this nice um, continuous representation with this really neat ordering. So we've got this very explicit representation of color that also respects a nice um, ordering on the colors. And we get a similar um, picture when we look at the plots as before, so run them through the encoder, color code each instance, and maybe I'll just read to you. So on the color dimension, it goes from, uh, this is green, um, blue, indigo, violet, red, orange, yellow, on well, that one's green. Anyway, it's the, it's the order of the rainbow. And you can see actually in this example that a bit of information about color looks like it's being encoded in the variance on the size dimension. And we're not quite sure why that is. You sometimes get these odd patterns. But the important thing here is that, again, I'm just demonstrating that we respect the order. Okay, so that's the end of the first half. Um, so we did quite a bit of additional work that's all in this tech report that's available on archive. So one thing we did was just built a simple classifier. So I've just given you these um, qualitative results where the representations look to be clean and neat and the sort of representations we'd like. But of course, we'd like to use this, uh, these representations for something, eventually in some sort of agent. So we just built a simple classifier that just classifies images, tells you what the concepts are. I mean, from a computer vision perspective, this is completely trivial. I don't expect you to be impressed by it. Um, but the classifier works and it gives almost 100%. The other thing we did was so far all of the training instances have all four labels all the time. So it's always, you know, blue, circle, medium, top. Whereas in a more realistic scenario, you can imagine teaching a robot, you're not going to give it all the concepts that it, it could possibly have access to. You might just say, here's a red circle, there's a chair. So we also built a system where the training data can consist of varying numbers of labels. It doesn't need all four. You can just say this is red. And technically, we did that with a Gaussian mixture model. That worked really nice. Um, and then there's so much we could do in the future. So you might think now we've got these lovely representations that they might be more sample efficient, maybe easier to learn than a generic VAE. You might think that the system will generalize better, particularly in out of distribution cases. We'd like to use these conceptual representations in a task. So an obvious thing would be something like an RL agent playing a video game. Again, DeepMind have already done a bit of work like that. And then this question that I sort of um, brushed over a little bit, but the learning of the conceptual domains is really important. So we've assumed that we know them. So we, it would be good if we could come back to that and maybe combine our techniques with some of the other methods that are already out there. Um, and then It'd be nice if we could have an ordering on the concept, so we can imagine having examples in the data like dark red and forming a hierarchy. It's a little tricky in this case, because then you've got to ask the question, um, how do you order Gaussians? So this is, in fact, uh, I think this is how my latest collaboration with Bob started. I sent him an email a few years ago and said, Bob, how do you order Gaussian distributions? And he pointed me at some MSc thesis from a few years ago. Turns out that's quite hard. There's not, not, not an obvious way of doing it, so we're going to come back to that in the second part of the talk. And then finally, we're interested in capturing correlations across domains. So one example we often use here is that of banana. You can think of a banana as a sweet yellow fruit or a bitter green fruit. So sometimes there are in, you get interesting correlations across domains in the definition of a concept, and we'd like to be able to capture that if we can. Yeah, okay, so that was it for the classical part. Just to repeat, the quantum section now is work in progress. So I'll have a little, I'll have a few preliminary results, but mainly a bunch of ideas. So again, the first thing you want to know is why quantum? What's the point of going from that classical setup? And the first thing I want to say is that we're not arguing for any sort of quantum advantage at this stage. So I'm not claiming that the models we've got um, are models that you can't simulate 
classically, and in fact, all the results I'll show you are done in classical simulation. Now, of course, in the future, it might be that we use quantum circuits that, hard, that are hard to simulate classically and provide good conceptual representations, but we don't have an argument for like, like that at the moment. So our main motivation right now is really representational. So what I mean by that is that once we move to the realm of, of quantum and start to think about these representations mathematically, then it just feels very natural, I think, to capture things like correlations across domains. When you start to think about a concept as a, a pure state or effect, it just feels like a very nice place to be mathematically to think about conceptual modeling. So the pictures here, the details aren't important. I'm just highlighting the fact that in the group at Oxford, there's already quite a bit of work on category theoretic treatments of concepts, for example. So um, factoring the conceptual domains using the tensor product is a natural thing to do. So that's really the hand wavy argument right now, that we just think that being in quantum is an interesting thing for us to be thinking about. Okay, so how are we gonna build a, um, a quantum system that learns conceptual representations. The way we thought about it was this. We said, we've got this classical system. Can we just make that quantum? And we could have just tried to build the equivalent of a quantum conceptual VAE. That's difficult. So there are papers out there that talk about building a quantum convolutional neural network, for example. Um, but to start off, the, as I said, the thing we really care about is the representation. So, in order to make our lives easier, the first thing we did was instead of having a generative model, we're gonna build a discrete or discriminative, sorry, discriminative classifier. See what I did there? I just reversed the direction of those arrows. So this is gonna be a classifier that takes an image X as input, um, represents that image in a Hilbert space. That's gonna be the, represent, the explicit representation of the concepts. Um, and then we'll be able to predict the concept labels associated with that image. That's how we're gonna set things up. So what things should be classical and which, being, which bits quantum? So as I said, we don't wanna do a quantum convnet at this stage, so we're gonna have a classical CNN at the bottom. The hidden space now, this, um, this Z space I've been talking about, that's gonna be the quantum part, and then we'll have a classical label out the top. So forget about the graphical model now, don't worry about the probabilities, let's change the notation a little bit. So we're gonna use parameterized quantum circuits or PQCs. So again, just to repeat, we've got um, an image goes in as input into our convolutional neural network, same architecture as before. But now instead of predicting the means and variances of these Gaussians that I had, we're gonna pr predict the, some set of real values, real parameters thetas that de define this PQC. And I'll show you what the PQC is in a minute, but it's just gonna be really simple actually. In our first experiment, it's just gonna be a sequence of rotations. That we're not even gonna have any entangling states. So there's gonna be some real values associated with that PQC that the component has to predict. And then what's the explicit representation of a concept? Well, that's gonna be a PQC as well. So um, before we had those means and variances of the Gaussians, now we're gonna have these parameters phi. So for blue, we're gonna have some set of parameters, we're gonna be a sequence of rotations which essentially define uh, that concept. And you can think of this as a quantum state or because it's pure, a quantum effect. So that's what a, represent, that's what a concept is gonna be in our quantum representation. It's gonna be a effect. Um, so I'm not sure I need to go through that again. Uh, oh, maybe one thing I could stay, say at this stage is that because these images are quite simple, um, we just use a single qubit per domain. So this Y here is just a single qubit, and we're gonna have color, shape, position, and size on each one of those wires. Um, so what have I done there? Oh yeah, so one thing I've done, actually I didn't say, uh, oh no, sorry, let me back up a little bit. So this is just about factorization. So all I want to say on this slide is that we've got this factored model where we've got each domain is on a single wire, um, and this is what the encoder circuit looks like. So as I said, about as simple as you could imagine, it's just a sequence of rotations. So on each qubit, we just rotate about the x, y, and z axis. Oh yeah, Matty. Is there what? Just three colors. Uh, uh, no, no, we've got uh, three colors. And later... Yeah, so um, I'm gonna show you a picture later. I think it'll become clear. Yeah, thanks. So eventually we want to do some entangling gates and have nice correlations and that sort of thing, but initially, yeah, we're just asking, can we encode 
colour on a single qubit. And yes, so here's, the, here's the, um, the intuition here. So the idea is, just to repeat, that a concept like circle, square, triangle is going to be a pure state or equivalently a pure effect. And then what the encoder is trying to do, we're trying to teach the encoder such that when it's given a triangle, assuming that shape is on the zero dimension, um, it wants to predict these rotations such that the resulting state or effect is basically close to this conceptual prior. So we're trying to build this, dis this discriminative classifier. Um, so how do we do the training? Ah, so here what I've done is I've taken that second PQC and sort of turned it round. So I've taken the dagger, so now the zeros you read it. This is the input zero state going in from the right. And the reason I've done it like that is now I can just um, do sequential composition, just plug the wires together and take measurements um, on, the, on the output. So being a bit of a quantum newbie, the way I naively think of that is that if I've got this zero, these zero states going on the right, when I plug them together, I get a, better get them coming back out again when I take measurements. So that's essentially how the, uh, the training is going to work. And the measurement we take, oh no, sorry, not quite there yet. So the full quantum circuit now, just going back after I've done the composition, is I've got my three rotations from the encoder, X, Y, and Z, and then I essentially reverse them um, with the conceptual priors. So I've got rotation about X, Y, and Z, and then I go Z, Y, and X, and hopefully get a zero coming out the other end on each of the wires. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you. So we'll have um, different values for blue, Y, and green, yeah. So blue will now correspond to three real numbers, which is each of the rotations, and that's what we're trying to learn. Um, so what measurement do we do? We do a Z measurement, I've just written down the mathematical expression for that. Um, so in fact, what we're really trying to optimize here for the positive examples is this probability. So that just says that the state coming out Q ought to be really close to zero. Um, in fact, you can rearrange that or rescale it so that that Z measurement's between naught and one, and then you can just use a binary, a standard binary cross entropy loss, just treat it as a probability. So that's what we do. We put negative examples in as well. This is a binary classifier. So we have examples where we've got a blue image as input, or blue circle, and we say this is not red. It's not square, it's not small, and it's not at the bottom. So here what we're trying to do notice is the state that comes out now needs to be as close as possible to one rather than zero, because we want it to be orthogonal as far away as possible. So that's what we're optimizing for. Uh, don't read too much into exactly where these states or effects end up. But um, just to give you an idea, you do get this nice separation. So it's not too hard to stick three colors on a qubit, turns out, and, and learn that nice separation. Same thing for uh, position, shape, and, and size. Um, you probably won't get the title. Maybe people are old enough and come from the, uh, maybe from the UK and America. This is from a nursery rhyme. I'd encourage you to Google it. So we can sing a rainbow too in the quantum domain. This was a bit harder. And the one on the left is a little bit cherry-picked. But we do get this nice effect where blue, indigo, and violet are clustered together, orange, red, and yellow, and green's off on the other side. One on the right is not quite so neat, but still pretty good. So I think one thing we want to test now um, quite soon is what happens if we go to two qubits per wire, particularly for the color domain. You imagine it would be a bit easier to get the separation. But you can stick seven colors. Um, on a qubit and, and train the whole thing successfully. Uh, we've got a classifier. So how well does the classifier work? As I said, just to repeat, from a computer vision perspective, this is a trivial classification problem. But for shape, position, and size, we essentially get 100%. It's not quite 100 for the color. I'll read some of these out because the number's a bit small. So for indigo, for example, we're getting an F score of about 86, 89 for orange, 100% for green. So overall accuracy is 93%. So it's not bad. Um, not quite perfect for the, for the rainbow. Okay, so I said this is work in progress. We're right in the middle of doing this work now. One thing we can do straight away is run on an actual quantum computer. We've got a tiny number of qubits, no problem, just one qubit per domain. Or well, as I said, I think you know, um, using more qubits per domain is an interesting question. Of course, we want to put some entanglement layers in, uh, particularly to capture correlations. So one question we ask ourselves a lot is, um, is entanglement the thing we really want to properly model uh, correlations in, in concepts? So go back to the banana example. Um, what did I say? It's a yellow sweet fruit or a green bitter fruit. Do we want entanglement to capture that or is it more like a statistical classical correlation? And I think we're not sure at the moment. 
Um, one really nice thing about the quantum model is that there's an obvious way to get a conceptual hierarchy. So rather than use pure effects, um, we can use mixed effects. And then my quantum friend, Sean, tells me that these are naturally ordered. Very easy then to, at least in theory, have dark red sitting below red in some partial order. And then obvious things to do, we're not really sure about how to do it, go to more realistic data. And it'd be really nice if we had a story about how learning the domains turned out to be easier in the quantum realm, but we, we don't have that at the moment, we haven't really thought about it. So to conclude, uh, yes, mentioned the tech report on the classical part. Um, so this talk was really about the empirical machine learning that we're doing. There's a whole other side to the research program that's led by Sean, which is about how to formalize concepts, in particular inspired by garden force theory of conceptual spaces. So there's a whole categorical treatment that Sean's produced. And of course, we've got some nice string diagrams associated with it. So I'd encourage you to go and read that work as well. And I think that's it, yes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>